Hello, a very warm welcome. My name is Carolyn Kassan, and I am the Academic Director of the NYU Center for Global Affairs. And I am also really excited to announce that um, I have recently been able to launch a new lab at the School of Professional Studies, the Energy, Climate Justice, and Sustainability Lab. And today's event is our second event in our launch series. And of course, the timing is perfect. We are in the middle of Earth Week, Earth Week 2021. The end of this week, we'll be seeing, I think, some, some great news coming out of the Climate Summit that is being hosted by the United States. Very excited about that. And really just delighted to have the opportunity to, uh, to bring you today's event. Today's event is climate justice work in cities. And we have an all-star lineup and a fantastic moderator. Dr. Michael Shank is the Director of Communications for the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. He is also a wonderful and esteemed member of the NYU CGA faculty. Um, he teaches our sustainable development course. Um, he's been with us, I think, for over five years at this point. Um, and what he does in the classroom is, I believe, so important and critical for the work that's going to be discussed today, um, but also really preparing the next generation of climate change leaders, climate justice change leaders, um, and really helping students to understand the power of communication, both in terms of their um, uh, what they say and how they communicate and, and, and the power of written communication. So I wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Um, we will be having one more event next week um, that we'll be looking at the upending of the energy landscape and that's going to be on the 27th. Um, but today it's about talking about climate justice in US cities. So over to you, Michael. And again, I just wanna thank you all to our panelists. We're really, really grateful to have all of you participating today. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn, and thanks, Michelle, and thanks to NYU for hosting this. I'm so excited to be in this conversation with the practitioners and panelists that have joined us today. And I hope I'm seeing a lot of my students out there because I flagged this for my students. So hello, students, glad you're here. Let's jump in. I'm not gonna be long in terms of my intro because this is really about the practitioners who were at the table talking with us today. But as you know from your RSVP, you saw the invite. This is about fostering a just transition in cities to a clean carbon neutral future that recognizes and redresses both the disproportionate burdens and benefits of the fossil fuel economy. What are we exploring today? How to prioritize climate action that advances the health and well-being of communities of color, low-income communities, and other historically marginalized communities. So what we're gonna do today is this. I'm gonna read to you the three questions that we've worked up together as a group in advance of this panel, in advance of this conversation. I'm gonna read these three questions and then we're gonna go city by city in terms of how each of these cities or nonprofits or NYU think tanks are addressing these three questions. So I'm gonna share them with you now. And then these three questions will guide the panelists' contributions. So we each have about five minutes. We'll hopefully get through half past, well, a little past uh, 12.30, maybe 12.40 Eastern. And then we'll get into some Q&A with all of you, which Michelle will help manage. So thank you in advance, Michelle. So here are the three questions that we've posed to the panelists. One, how are you shifting power from city government to priority communities from inside a large bureaucracy? This question will obviously be relevant to our city staff, our city officials here today, uh, but the next two will be more relevant to the environmental nonprofits and think tanks at NYU. Second question, how do you make the case that slowing down and listening to priority communities can actually speed the large scale changes needed to address the climate crisis? And three, how do you foster alignment between the needs identified by priority communities and climate action? So those three questions are what will guide our conversation today. Again, my name is Michael Shank. I work for the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, which is a global nonprofit that is also prioritizing the just transition and climate justice and equity in our work. And then Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance is an affiliate of our kind of mothership, Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which is a North American nonprofit, 200 plus cities in USDN 
and CNCA, my organization for which I do communications, is a kind of affiliate of it. So let's jump in. I want to start with Sam Barrasso. Sam Barrasso is from the city of Portland, Oregon. He's the program manager and he covers the Portland Clean Energy Fund there, which is doing a lot of great work. Portland is a member of CNCA, Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. So I'm hearing a lot of these updates from Sam's colleagues about the good work they're doing in the climate justice space. So I'm excited for you, Sam, to share with us some of the work you're doing. Over to you. Thank you, Michael. And it's good to be here with you all. Um, so as, as Michael shared, I, I, I get to be the fortunate program manager of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And I'm just going to give a quick background on what the Portland Clean Energy Fund is before I jump into answering these questions. I think it's really relevant. Um, Portland Clean Energy Fund was passed by Portland voters. So it was developed as a, as a, as a voter initiative um, in November 2018. And so it's, uh, and we started implementing the program and I've been with the city um, almost two years now, um, a little bit, a little bit shy of, um, of 20 months. And so the, from, the, from the start, the, the Portland Clean Energy Fund in this instance, it truly was and born, is and by and for and born of the community. And it is the result of folks within the community, black and brown folks organizing, organizing alongside folks with low incomes, others in gathering thousands of signatures, getting it on the ballot, and then ultimately passing it um, through a whole host of door knocking and other events that, that galvanized the, the community and passed with over 65% of the vote in November 2018. And so I think as we talk about just what it means to shift power from city government to priority communities inside large bureaucracies, I want to acknowledge that the Portland Clean Energy Fund is, is truly a gift from the community to the city. Once uh, the folks passed it at the ballot, it became a city program. And so it's a city program that is funded by a gross um, a gross revenue tax measure. It taxes, it's a tax on um, billion dollar corporations that make a certain amount within the city and it's specifically focused on their city of Portland sales. And it generates 40 to $60 million a year. And we expect closer to $60 million a year annually to invest in climate action projects that both advance racial and social justice. So that's what the Portland Clean Energy Fund is. But it's important as we think about answering this question to just take a step back and acknowledge that a lot of what that shifting of power and even getting to what the Portland Clean Energy Fund is today was actually a result of much of the work that happened earlier within the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, which is our city agency that, that manages the city's climate action plan. And I want to just acknowledge that back in 2015, when we were working on the last, and I wasn't with the city then, but I could say we, uh, was working on the last iteration of the climate action plan. There was an intention at that point to say that We've been doing climate action plans since the early 1990s. Portland was the first city to have a climate action plan. And, and so, but it was important to start shifting the way we were doing it because while we've had a lot of advances in the ways in which we practice sustainability, um, uh, clean energy, uh, and just a low carbon lifestyle and lowering our carbon emissions overall within the city, that we knew that that wasn't getting across to everyone. And so that was one of the first early efforts to seed an equity roundtable that deliberately and closely worked with the climate action plan and helping formulate what was the 2015 climate action plan. And over time, it was those same folks, that same investment in that core, in that cohort of folks. And I don't want to, I don't want to discount. I will say that the city didn't just say, let's bring you all in and have you all advise and give feedback to our climate action plan. It was demanded by the community. So there's always a, a tango in, the, in, in what it means to shift power and that community demands it. And, and government responds and, and figuring out how to respond and work as, as more equal collaborative partners. And so that was a lot of the seed, those same partners that was at that early table ultimately came back and organized and created the seed that ultimately became the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, so I, I, I'm sure there'll be other questions, but I'll, I'll just see that, that that's a little bit of how we shifted power to create the Portland Clean Energy Fund. When um, we talk about within the Portland Clean Energy Fund, just making the case for slowing down and listening to communities historically left out and how that can actually result in large scale changes. It's, it's, it, for us, it's been a framing of it's an imperative. We know, again, I, I said Portland has a long history of climate action of being a green city, but it's also, I think, fair to say that a lot of those efforts have focused on some of the lower hanging fruit, so to speak. And for you know, much of us, we know that that has meant providing climate benefits to wealthier homeowners, wider homeowners, and not necessarily climate benefits to black and brown folks, folks with low incomes. So as we 
think certainly about the scale of investment and innovation needed to address the 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 scale of our you know the the um, our, our 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 climate needs and averting sort of the worst impacts of climate change. We've been acknowledging from the get go that we absolutely have to be making those same investments and that same innovation in our communities that have been long left out. In Oregon, we have, we've had a, energy, a, a residential energy efficiency tax credit program that provides wealthier homeowners with tax credits for solar, for energy efficient dishwashers, stoves, uh, heat, water heaters. We've had that for 40 years. So we've been investing in other communities consistently for decades. And what we're acknowledging now is we need, to, we need to understand how to make those same investments and support that same innovation within communities of color and, 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 and folks with low incomes. And so it's, it's really an imperative if we think we, if we have any hopes to understanding how we collectively marshal the, 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 the entire community and being part of uh, the solution to addressing our climate woes. And so I'll, I'll just, I know, I know other folks can really speak to fostering alignment between the needs identified within communities and climate action, but I'll just, I'll acknowledge that there's, in, in working within government and in, in working with communities, that there's a lot of nuance in those relationships. The city and the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, where, where, where our program is seated, certainly has experts paid day in and day out to think about all the nuances of, of, of climate, and yet it's always been important to acknowledge the expertise that we don't necessarily have that sits within the community, within the folks that are every single day sitting right there on the street sides or, or you know, with, 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 their, with their fronts where folks are coming in and connecting with them regularly saying what's working for them, what's not. And so there's just, it's really been a, um, a recognition of what power we bring and the power that, and acknowledging the power that community brings and, and, and creating and, and, and understanding and appreciating and valuing each of those different powers as we've started to work and foster more alignment between, between our, our mutual efforts, um, which, which are, are truly mutual. So um, I just appreciate y'all being here and I'm excited to see some of the questions that, that come forth. And, uh, and I'll say that we just, we finally just finished our inaugural round of grant funding where we released our first, um, about roughly $9 million of funding. And it, it, it's, an exciting, it's an exciting cohort of proposals and it starts to set the stage of what we, we hope to see and, and some of the work we hope to share nationally. Um, so um, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Sam. And I want to draw folks' attention to the, the chat. I put in a link to the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And if you check out that site, there's some more history in terms of how it evolved. And I just want to reiterate Sam's point about created and led by the community and how important that is. And, and Portland as a city seeing the importance of that and really giving power to the community and, and ensuring that they're creating and leading this process. Sam, thank you so much. Let's let's go over to Dan. Dan Gilbo is the chief of the Sustainability and Equity Branch at the DC Department of Energy and Environment. Over to you, Dan. Awesome. Thanks. And thanks for having me here. Um, I should mention that I am actually an, uh, an NYU Wagner alum, so uh, really happy to be at this event um, specifically. Um, so I've been in my job for around 10 years now, and I, I feel like I've just felt this major shift in the way we're doing our work. Um, and you know who who we is both in terms of like who, who we is in terms of government and who we is in terms of the community. I think is like is always a big question, which we can get into as we go on. But I'll just say that I really started the work because um, of Portland. So thanks to you, Sam, and you know your your colleagues like Desiree Williams Raji, who's now a uh, you know consultant with um, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, is how I really started this work. But I very much feel like I'm still learning and growing. And so I'm happy to, you know, share what I what I've learned and what my experiences have been. But I, you know, I'm by no means an expert uh, in in this work. Um, I also just want to recognize that as as a white man, um, you know, I've got my own blinders and uh, I'm aware of them and love, um, you know, having them pointed out to me. So if there's anything that I say at any point in time, would love um, for anyone who's interested uh, in that investment in me to share those with me. Um, I think just one more thing I wanted to say is that I came across this quote recently by Lilla Watson, who's an Aboriginal activist, and it really spoke to me so much that it's something that I'm, I'm really trying to keep front of mind in a lot of um, in my work in doing sort of the intersection of equity and climate work. And that quote is, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come here um, because your liberation is bound up with mine, 
then let us work together. And that to me is, is really powerful because I think particularly for, for government employees, but particularly for white government employees, a lot of times we come from a mindset of like, how, um, how do we help people? I have answers, I have resources, I've got the solutions to everything. Uh, I wanna come and help you um, needy community. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, that, that's been a major, major shift for me, but that's, that's like a really different way of going about things. And I really believe that as a white man, um, my, my own liberation and freedom from my own, my guilt, my shame, and my own self-generating uh, toxicity is, is very, very much bound up in, in my own equity work, particularly racial equity work. So that's a driving factor for me in all of this. And I really think that's an important thing for, for me, when I think about how do I shift power from government to the community, that's, those are some pretty driving factors. Um, I'll also just mention in terms of like large intro before I keep going on, which I, is, that is a very quick moving clock down there, um, is that I think thinking about what is community is a, is a really important component of this too. Um, you know, in government, we often have our go-to people who we, who we tap every single time for things and like they're the community for us. But I think it's really important to build authentic relationships with, with not just grass top leaders, but, but, but broad community as well. So that's what I'm gonna focus the rest of my very brief time in talking about is building authentic um, partnerships with, with community. So I think there's a few really important ingredients in that for me is one, um, particularly again, as like I think a white person, but I think anyone in government, it's really important to understand the history of communities. I think a lot of times we'll start a new project, we'll start a new plan, and we'll um, parachute in. And um, you know, when we start, it's the beginning of the history, right? But there is a very long history with most communities. Uh, and the history with government is, um, is generally not been our super positive one. So as a representative government, I think it's really important to know that we, we are the face of government and every bad interaction and broken promise that government has made before, we're the face of that and that's like legitimate and that's something we need to both be aware of and, and be working to not add to and hopefully help solve. So I think that's really important in, in recognizing that, that history that's there. Um, two, I think in government, it's really important when shifting power um, to listen, to understand. It's just really easy. And I think there's a real pressure in government to have all the answers and to be the solver. Um, but I think really listening to the experience and listening to the solutions that are already in the community um, and listening to genuinely understand, not to listen to like right up on this board and see I listen to you. I have proof I wrote it on the giant notepad. Uh, I think is really, really critical. So that, that to me is a, a one important piece. Uh, two, I really, I think investing in relationships with community-based organizations in the community in general is really, really critical, easy to say, hard to do. But for me, that involves really difficult conversations and really owning the power that we have as district government, as government um, employees. Um, and um, I have participated the last three years in this project called 100% Renewable and Equitable Cities. And for three years, um, you know, I came to the same meeting uh, and with the same people, which I think is a different kind of accountability that's important in general too. But I really, one thing I really learned from that was owning the power that I do have as a government employee. It often feels like I am middle management. I don't, I can't make that decision. That's way above my pay grade. But one thing that I was hit hard for me uh, over and over again was that I own a lot, I do have a lot of power and it's really important for me to own that power and be representing the, um, the, the, the goals and objectives of my community partners in the ways that I do have power and to both to share uh, the information that I have as a you know, insider within government with my community partners. Um, one, so like Sam was sort of talking about like, I think it's really important for community groups to advocate and make demands, but it's a lot easier to do that if they've got access to information that we have um, so being transparent is really important. And then the final thing I'll just say is that we're pretty well resourced as governments in doing a lot of this work and doing research and going to community meetings and things like that. Uh, and we pay consultants really well. If we are really looking to shift power to community, I think resourcing community groups, um, residents uh, and, and community organizations in terms of stipends, childcare, uh, transportation and feeding people when we're holding meetings at mealtimes is all really, really important ways to, to shift power. Um, I have a lot more to say, but that was about my five minutes. So I'm going to, I'm going to save it for follow-up questions and again, appreciate the opportunity to be here.
Thank you, Dan. And as folks will see, these questions are really about process. And I appreciate Sam's points on process in working with the local community and city of Portland, as well as Dan's points on process as a white man operating in this space and some of what he's working through. And certainly I can relate to that. And when he talked about his process that resonated with me, but also in terms of understanding history before working with the community. So Dan, thank you for those critical points. Let's go to Peggy now. Peggy Shepard is the co-founder and executive director for WE Act for Environmental Justice, which is based in New York City. Peggy, over to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great being here today. Um, when we think about making the case for slowing down and listening to priority communities, um, absolutely, it can speed the large scale changes that we need to address the climate crisis. But I would also start by saying that you can't have climate justice without environmental justice. And so um, I started doing this work in West Harlem 33 years ago um, around community struggles, around sewage treatment plants, diesel bus depots, and a whole host of polluting facilities. And over the years, we have evolved to uh, not just stop bad things, but bring good benefits, whether it's waterfront parks, whether it's leeds rated facilities. Um, we have really understood that working with affected residents and communities, engaging them in decision-making is the way to create the kinds of policies that create sustainable, healthy communities. So I would also say that it's not always the case of slowing down government. Sometimes the community is on the cutting edge and way ahead of the curve. So, um, I guess it's been 20 years, I can't believe I was just adding it up, that Mayor Bloomberg um, was elected in New York and developed Plan YC. And so I was one of three environmental justice um, advocates um, who was on that sustainability advisory board and have continued uh, under Mayor de Blasio as well. And so that has been a way to really collaborate with government and, and try to to make their initial themes and initial um, uh, cha challenges and initiatives, try to make those um, accessible to the community and to infuse those initiatives with the experience and expertise of communities. So for instance, when Plan YC was getting started, we realized there was nothing around food justice. There was nothing around waste management. Um, and so we were able over the years to begin to infuse the plan um, with those kinds of initiatives as well. And it really led to um, my organization, We Act for Environmental Justice, which is based in Harlem, thinking about um, certainly after um, Hurricane uh, Sandy, um, really thinking about the impact on communities and how communities need to mobilize and develop their own climate action plans that they can then submit to, to government and begin to, to organize the community around. So we developed a Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. We organized 400 residents in the four uptown neighborhoods, uh, East, West, Central Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood. And we really brought folks together in uh, a process called Serious Games. And um, we wanted to develop scenarios uh, to help them understand what could happen. Um, and then we wanted to understand if the worst happened, how would they resolve those issues? And so we gathered that data and then we came back to those neighborhoods and said, okay, this is what you've said. What does government, government need to do to help resolve these issues as well? And then we began to involve city government um, in coming to our meetings and um, basically providing some response to the issues that you heard us raising. And out of that plan uh, came a priority, which surprised me, um, of energy security. Uh, people really felt that they had been 
a subject to so many brownouts and blackouts and that they really want it to be secure in terms of energy issues. And so we developed um, a solar program of training um, un underemployed folks to do solar installation. And then we decided to target, to collaborate with other uh, organizations doing solar work like Solar One. And we uh, targeted low income tenant cooperatives called HDFCs. And we targeted them for solar because you know gentrification is discussed quite a bit. And we believe one way to keep uh, gentrification at bay is to keep affordable housing really affordable. And so we also have developed a worker cooperative called Sun Solar Uptown Now, because we also understood that black and brown people cannot always get into the construction unit uh, unions here in New York City. And so what are those alternative affiliations that we could help develop? Um, and so we had 12 young men who wanted to develop this business. We sent them to the worker cooperative uh, up in the South Bronx that's run by Omar Freya, a wonderful um, young man and organization. And they are now, um, they just finished a nine acre solar array upstate. They're uh, incorporated, they're getting their, um, you know, their um, certifications for minority business. And we are helping to incubate, incubate that, um, you know, that organization uh, in our offices. So I would also think that, you know, there, there's often this urgency that says, um, well, we want to work with the community, but it's going to take too long. And that's a sense of false urgency that you often find from academia and white-led organization that it takes too much time to reach out to communities of color, it slows down the work, and there's no sense that outreach and engagement really adds value to the work because there's no understanding of the significance and value that diverse perspectives bring to creating solutions. So I realized that when we think about traditional public engagement practices, they just are not effective. And we have to think about community consultation and collaboration, but not you know, these, uh, these listening sessions <laughs> where if people listen, uh, you get no feedback, there's no sharing uh, uh, of co-knowledge. Um, but how do we really begin to collaborate and listen to each other? Because the one thing that I've certainly experienced is that when the community is organized around an initiative or a project uh, or community-based plan, that it creates a consensus that makes it easier for government to then uh, come in and interact and collaborate because you have pulled together all the different sectors of the community and you found some kind of consensus about going forward and a direction. So um, I think I'll stop there, but just wanna say that um, we have to understand the significance of the diversity of perspectives. And we might not have had the disaster in New Orleans after Katrina, if the government had really included a diversity of people in thinking about planning, because the government obviously did not know that low-income communities didn't have a car to evacuate. They didn't seem to know that low-income communities may not have a credit card to go to a hotel. And so thus, you have all of those folks um, sitting in, a, um, in an arena for, for weeks with no place to go. So again, we, we need to understand the importance uh, and the value of diverse perspectives and collaboration. So thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you for leading with the point that community is often way ahead of the curve, which is absolutely true, and finishing with some really important points about outreach and engagement, and this idea of taking too long, that true engagement, true outreach, that really elicits and create a safe, creates a safe space for community to uh, guide the process, direct the process, advise the process, 
this false urgency that often circumvents that necessary community engagement. And so thank you for lifting this up because you're absolutely right that uh, too many organizations fast track these listening sessions without actually taking the necessary time to build the trust, to factor in Dan's point about history and, and to Sam's point about making sure the process is created and led by the community and that's where the value is and uh, it really needs to be directed by the community, but setting up new practices for outreach and engagement is so critical because the traditional ones, the ones we've used historically have not uh, created both the, the process or the timeline necessary for, for um, legitimate engagement that you've spoken of, Peggy. Thank you so much for that. Let's uh, move on to our final presenter. Matthew Quatinens is the director of the NYU SPS uh, Urban Lab, but he's also got some city roles that he'll speak to. But for those of you in the NYU space, know that he is the director of the Urban Lab there. And I also want to mention for all the panelists, I've been trying to add links as you go. It's, I didn't know, Dan, specifically which link I should send. I'm putting this in there, but I'm sure you've got some links too, because ultimately folks on this call will be interested in further engaging. We Act's work as just one example the history that Peggy spoke to in Manhattan and in Harlem and North uh, that they've done for decades now in the community, do check out their website. But I'm trying to add as many links as possible. If folks want to follow up and see more and read more and, and get to know these organizations and these cities work. So to the panelists, uh, if you're not seeing the links that should be in there, please add some links. And if any questions come up in the Q&A tool that you want to address specifically, I hope you feel free to do that too. All right, Matthew, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I really appreciate being invited uh, to be here. I also want to echo um, Dan and Michael's comments. Um, I think especially now being asked as a white person of privilege to come and speak at something like this, I think you have to sort of justify why. Um, and uh, I think that's a good thing. I hope um, the experience that I've had um, leading up to becoming the director of the NYU Urban Lab um, I actually began as a community organizer about um, 25 years ago uh, in Seattle um, and uh, have worked my way through a lot of jobs um, trying to realize outcomes um, in partnership with community and as sort of a um, hub or enabler of frameworks that empowered communities that eventually led me to work for the city of New York um, at the New York City Economic Development Corporation um, where I worked as the head of asset management and infrastructure and wound up spending a lot of time trying to reorient outreach strategies um, more closely to uh, some of the things that Peggy said, which I really resonate with. Um, the idea that community outreach slows things down um, definitely is not uh, accurate. And in, in, in fact, I think the opposite is true. Um, not having uh, community involvement and outreach can truly um, not only slow things down, but also force the wrong things to occur. Um, I'll dive into that in, in one second. I would say while I was working in the city of New York, we had an effort um, that we started trying to turn um, the whole portfolio um, into a carbon negative portfolio um, and also uh, address other emissions. Um, and as a part of that, we started um, outreaching across on the portfolio into communities and in particular um, into the Hunts Point community and into the Sunset Park community um, where there is a lot of um, historic issues, especially around environmental justice um, with both emissions um, from industrial work that is being done, a lot, a lot of truck traffic now, especially and those emissions going into um, low income neighborhoods, but also in terms of flood resiliency um, and uh, the ability uh, to actually be in those areas long term and um, have deteriorating equity in both your homes and in your businesses based on um, locations that were determined um, long ago. Um, uh, inside the Urban Lab and how I uh, try to help address some of these things or add to the dialogue of some of these things is we're really trying to create a platform um, to allow for the exchange of ideas and not to speak on high of what should happen but rather surface what solutions are happening um, and really raise up the voices of people in the community 
um, that actually are uh, ahead of the curve, as Peggy said, and are um, accomplishing things so others can learn from them and also hear those stories and be inspired. I think a part of what we need to do is rewrite the narrative of history that solutions came from just certain places. Um, very often solutions actually um, are coming from the community and it's not realized that that's where they are from. So I think a part of moving power from um, city government to local is rewriting the story about how change has happened in the past and um, not only listening, but also finding that alignment and um, empowering people with both knowledge, but also with funding. Listening and hearing is not enough. It sort of reinforces the idea that change can only happen from government or from um, empowered business in terms of wealth. And I think a lot of what the struggle needs to be um, from uh, some of the perspectives that I've seen is trying to create structures that can actually empower people. Um, it's fine to, to say from somewhere, oh, that idea of the community is such a great idea, but why is it still incumbent on the empowered person to be the, the one that says it's good and to be able to implement it? A lot of it has to do with the distribution of wealth in corporate structure. And one of the areas that um, we've been starting to study a lot is cooperative structure. And uh, at different times in history, cooperatives have actually um, had much more dominating power um, than shareholder corporations. There's obviously a huge blend in there. I'm not saying all shareholder corporations are bad, but there's been a huge shift toward capital being empowered. And um, there is a, a lot of history of cooperative power of communities being able to um, accomplish things in, in climate in particular and in energy. Um, the rise of bringing power to rural areas um, really showcases this is a, a bipartisan issue and that is a big priority of the federal government right now um, to uh, empower local rural communities um, to have access to things like solar um, and constant energy. We're doing work right now in northern Nevada um, where there isn't a reliable power grid. Um, there are a lot of uh, indigenous lands that where people don't have access to power at all as well as low-income communities um, kind of in the area where um, nomad land was filmed, if you've seen that, um, that film. And a lot of what we have to do is not only throw money at a problem, but figure out how to empower people in organizational structures. We, we get a lot of bias um, toward the urban in um, some of these conversations. And in the rural, we unfortunately, in a lot of places, don't even have um, sitting governments outside the counties. So you have unincorporated areas without nonprofit structures, without um, city governments and local services, and you try to figure out ways to engage people and give them give them um, the power of knowledge and of money. And at the same time, it's an imposition on those people to participate. They have their own lives that they're trying to get on with. And I think that's a real thing that we need to think about more. The, the struggle of the people in rural environments um, is very different than um, what we find in urban. And while we are called the urban lab, we're very interested in the continuum of solutions that really connects um, urban and rural. The last thing um, I'll say, well, two more things. One is in terms of slowing down, I, I would really echo um, Peggy and say, slow is fast. Um, I've, I've probably worked on, I don't know, uh, a lot of projects. A lot of the panelists here have too. Um, uh, I think, probably we would be unanimous in saying when you think you're speeding up, you're, you're probably not because you're going to have to um, engage with all of those um, people to have a real solution. Um, you can have an announcement or a PR win, but if you're actually trying to make change, um, it's important to do that. Um, the one, one way also to accomplish that is to create boards and structures of organizations that actually involve the community. There's very often a feeling of having to put the usual suspects onto a community. We've, we um, recently have been part of starting an inclusive growth entity in the city of Austin. And one of the powerful things that I think we did was create almost a 30 member board, uh, many of whom had never been on such a board before um, and creating the structures to train them, to make them effective and not accept that we needed someone you know, more experienced or um, the usual suspects in order to make it empowered. Uh, representation is the power. And then the last thing I'll say about um, priority communities, um, I think listening is a great 
first step. Listening and responding and aligning is a good second step. But I think we need to get beyond that. We're looking at revolution, revolutionizing our entire economy right now. We need to do that um, to move forward in this country. And in that moment, we need to empower alternative anchor institutions that are trusted. We have a program at the um, Urban Lab um, to create a network of HBCUs um, and provide them with curriculum, master planning tools, et cetera, that they guide. We are, we are assistants in helping them obtain those resources. Um, but really, it's very important for us to equalize access to knowledge and tools. That's what we're trying to do at the Urban Lab and not just the ones we think are good, but spreading all the knowledge around so that people have equal access to that and then also have equal access to capital formation um, that allows you to use those tools. Getting a voice heard is good, but um, we also wanna empower people to actually take action that they believe um, is necessary. Thank you, Matthew. And I just wanna identify a couple of things you've said. You've said a, a lot there that could be shared out, but who gets recognition and who gives recognition? I think uh, that's, a, that's a very powerful point in this work and in this space, and then making sure all stakeholders are at the table uh, and feel like they have access to the decision-making process, um, which is something you ended with, which I think is also very powerful. I want to uh, make sure we are identifying questions that haven't yet come in. So if those of you who haven't submitted a question in the Q&A tool, please do so now. I'm gonna keep talking with our panelists until those questions come in. And Peggy, I wanna start with you because I know that you have to leave at 1 p.m. and you've got a busy week of talks ahead. Uh, thinking about narratives and something I talk about in my class a lot is that in the sustainable development space, in the solution space, and anyone who works on the SDGs, you know, the, even the UN knows what the solutions are. Uh, and yet it's really about building public will and political will. And so a lot of these process points are so important in building public will and political will. Do you think, uh, given the new administration, new federal government that we have in leadership with Biden, do you think the narratives now are, are friendlier to that building process, that public and political will building process, given that words like environmental justice, climate justice, even reparations are now being used more frequently. Are you hopeful that in terms of narratives being used now that we are entering a, a new more fertile space in terms of the tractability of, of this work? Curious your thoughts, uh, given, you know, you talked about the decades long work that you've been doing, does now feel different at all to you? It does. Um for a number of reasons. We've been in the middle of a COVID uh, epidemic that we now understand um, has impacted people of color living in air polluted communities more than others. So it, that has raised the issue of environmental justice. Um, we have a racial reckoning that um, it, it continues to, to fester uh, and not be resolved. And we have a climate crisis. And so I think all of those um, elements coming together, uh, coupled with uh, the presidential um, debates and the um, focus on environmental justice, the Biden administration's focus on environmental justice, I am very hopeful. Uh, mm -hmm. I am, uh, have the opportunity to co-chair the, the new White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and we are working on Justice 40, for instance, which is um, uh, which actually Biden took from New York City with the, uh, with the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, um, mandating 35% of benefits, uh, of energy benefits would go to frontline communities. So Biden has, has modeled that uh, for the federal agencies. And so we're now beginning as a, um, as a federal advisory committee of environmental justice advocates to really put the details on what that Justice 40 should look like. So I am very optimistic. I'm optimistic that the national green groups that for many decades have simply been all white, have only focused on um, you know, national uh, air quality and environmental issues, but not really thinking about frontline communities 
um, and where those hotspots are. Even those national green groups have now almost all of them begun to develop diversity initiatives and thinking about ways to have strategic partnerships with the environmental justice uh, and climate justice community. So I'm very optimistic. I appreciate your read on that. And I've put in the chat for everyone the White House announcement uh, to the council that Peggy mentioned. And it's it's very exciting that the federal admi administration is taking this work seriously, more seriously than it has in the past. And so thanks for your read on uh, optimism here and being hopeful in that work. We've got a couple of questions coming in. And Michelle, do you want to read out some of what's coming in? If I want to pull these questions, feel free. I just saw your message. Great. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to jump in for this one and then let you take the others. Um, this, this particular question is for Peggy. Um, and this attendee agrees with you that there's no climate justice without environmental justice. Uh, and further, the pandemic and the state of the nation highlight the need for education reform. Do you believe that incorporating environmental justice into K through 12 curriculum is essential? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm I'm glad for this question because um, we have just developed um, a state coalition to, to focus on getting climate and environmental justice education into schools, uh, K to 12, because we know that they are the future. They, they will be the folks in the next decades who will really be bearing the brunt of, of ensuring that we meet our climate targets. And so they've got to be educated around these issues. So absolutely, we're supporting that. And we're working with a whole coalition of educators and green groups uh, around that issue. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Peggy. There's another question that came in that is more technical that I would love for panelists, if you feel comfortable, to click on the Q&A tool and answer directly so that folks can see that uh, reference there, because what I would like to also lift up, and I'd be curious, Sam, if you've got some thoughts here, because I know Portland's done a lot of community engagement, uh, hewing to the kind of engagement that, that Peggy has talked about in terms of uh, not the traditional way, but a, a new way, which I know Portland has struggled with, because Portland wasn't always doing that, and then they they had a real self-reflective moment, and be like, oh, we have to do things differently. But tips and techniques or tools or advice to those gathered on this call who might be doing community engagement work for one of my classes as an assignment uh, or going forward in their own work, either with a city or national government or an environmental nonprofit or a company. Do you, have, do you have some more kind of lessons learned from the Portland experience that would be helpful here? And while Sam is answering that, I encourage other panelists uh, to weigh in on some of the questions coming in specifically um, some of the, the drawdown work that was referenced in the first question, and then we'll get to the second question that's come, that's come in. We'll get to that later. Over to you, Sam. Thank, thank you, Michael. I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short, relatively speaking, because this isn't, but fortunately I have people on, on the team that are, that are experts in, in thinking through and thinking about creatively, what does it mean to do community engagement? What does it mean to involve community and understand and break down our processes, our program to understand what is the most, some of those effective inputs for community engagement. I mean, it, there's always the desire to pull in community in every place. And, 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 and we tend to be like, how do we pull in community everywhere and get feedback and everything? And I've always been like, there's, there's also, it, it's incumbent on us to understand what are those positions of influence within our programs and breaking those down, understanding whether, whether, where those are, and then also understanding wh how might that overlap with uh, a, the community's desire or, or um, uh, in a way that's beneficial to communities to engage and participate in that particular area. So um, I, 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 I'm sure we could get into examples of that, but I just think that really even breaking down our community engagement to understand how, uh, that, you know, it's important to do it well, it's important to, 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 to ask, but at the same time, we have to be judicious with the valuable time of our community members and find out where is that some of those valuable and influential input points that actually really influence the outcome of a process. Um, and so um, I think that's, that's been some of the efforts that we've done is really doing some of that analysis work and mapping work to say, okay, this is, these are some of the precise points that we're going to actually reach out to the community and pull them in for their feedback, as opposed to kind of what I, I, I say is something that we, we will be better about because it can be the lazy approach is just trying to pull community into everything. And that actually, that just, we don't, we don't get to where we need to go in that, in that approach. I yeah. Think. 
Well, and it's what's already come up in this call too, being really mindful and respectful of the community's time too, because, and I think Dan, you mentioned just even creating a, a space where we're feeding people while we're engaging them so that it's a nourishing environment as well. Uh, and, and there's a lot of talk too about remunerating people for their time. Uh, that comes up a lot in our city's work. If we're gonna ask the community to advise and lead, how are we also supporting them with resources so that they're not being further exhausted by our engagement of them. So really critical points. Another question came in about liberal versus conservative cities. And I'm not sure who wants to answer this, but it was noted that a lot of the cities represented on this call are more liberal cities. What does engagement look like on these issues in conservative cities? So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts there. Uh, it looks like Peggy, you might be typing in an answer. I don't know if you wanna also voice that answer too. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, I, I know, especially in the South, where you have still have repressive state and city governments uh, in terms of black and brown communities, that this kind of work is being done uh, by citizen coalitions, uh, mom and pop uh, type uh, ad hoc groups, working with very few resources, but really trying to, to connect with with groups around the country and bring in expertise to help them. You know, a lot of the federal, federal government um, relief monies went to some of these Gulf Coast states that were, they're constantly inundated by hurricanes and that money never went to the black and brown communities that are still um, reeling from those impacts that, that haven't been resolved. So I think in the, the communities where uh, or the states where, like Florida, where the governor, you know, you can't even use the word climate change. Um, you do have groups there working on the ground um, with, res with some resources uh, to raise the consciousness of folks. Thank you, Peggy, for that. And I wanna thank all the panelists for helping answer these questions in the Q&A tool. I'm seeing Dan and Matthew and others typing in answers. Hopefully this is helpful for the questions coming in. Uh, there's another question that is similar to this whole liberal conservative, which is how do cities that are leading on this also kind of mentor, I'm putting words into this um, particular question, but bring along those other cities. And so uh, this is some of the leading by example. Curious for, the, for some of the city officials, are you finding that other cities are coming to you for mentorship and guidance? Like, how did you do it? What can we learn from you? So that's the question I guess for uh, well, anyone really, but I'm thinking Dan and Sam, if you've got other cities kind of knocking on your door and being like, how do we learn from you? Dan, I still can sub. I see you unmuted, so I'll let you go first. I meant to on camera, but yeah, thanks, Dan. I'll go first quickly. I mean, I think it's less about like, you know, mentorship more so than like, just like cities talking about how'd you do it this way? Um, we did it this way. I mean, no one's like getting it perfectly right. That's for that's for sure, right? So like I, I learned a lot from Portland, how they did a lot of their community engagement and were resourcing a lot of their groups. I learned like a lot from Seattle. I think uh, I've like since talked to other cities about things that we've done really well in, in resourcing groups, uh, listening to groups, but also like you said, Matthew, like going well beyond just that to um, being very accountable, holding ourselves accountable and providing the information and resources that's necessary for other groups to hold us accountable. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff wrapped up in that, but I, 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 cities are really well networked. And obviously, Michael, you know that with CNCA and the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, uh, we talk to each other a lot about what's worked well, what hasn't worked well. And that's, you know, big liberal cities like uh, Seattle and Portland, New York, but also, I mean, there's a lot of much smaller cities or, or more conservative cities or, or cities that are like in uh, Rust Belt cities in the, in the Midwest that are really saying, look, that doesn't work for us. It's really, really different for us. And so a lot of networking happening within each other and on that front too. Yeah, thanks for raising up that point. Sam, you took yourself off mute. Did you wanna, oh. <laughs> I was just going to say Dan had it on point. Exactly. I think the, the networking is huge. And, and I think the reality is that it, 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 cities have different contexts and, and, and cities collectives have a lot to learn from each other. So we are, we, we, we don't operate in our own, in our, in our bubbles. And, and it's, it's been, it's been having networks like CNCA as well as urban sustainability directors network have been, have been critical. Thanks for that. And the last question, Matthew, it looks like you're addressing it around the urban rural divide. I don't know if you want to lift up any final points there is, as you've answered it here? Um, maybe one. I mean, I know um, there's a lot in the 
urban and rural divide to talk about. The one thing I would say is that um, having worked in a lot of um, rural areas and also in the Southeast, I think there's a feeling from a lot of city folks that we know the answer and there's that that conversation is um, is a tough one because first of all, just going back to what we said at the beginning, I'm not so sure that's true <laughs> that the urban knows more than the rural and also they're very different places. And um, while in the in the city we have some of the diseconomies of agglomeration that the negative um, effect of being so close together and trucks being close together and industrial being close together. In a lot of rural areas, we have the disinvestment of industrialization and um, the lack of jobs and um, the outsourcing of food production, the outsourcing of industrial production um, and not good access to power or internet. And so the conversation um, there is about um, equity in jobs and the ability for people to live in the places they wanna live and still be able to have access to these things, whether it's access to power um, or uh, access to a, a job and the ability to live their life um, with dignity. All right, we are at time. I wanna thank so much Peggy who already had to leave because she had another speaking engagement, Sam, Dan, Matthew, thank you so much for your time and contributions. I want to thank everyone for gathering with us today to engage on this critical issue. And thank Carolyn and Michelle and the NYU team for pulling this together. Michelle, do you have any final points? Or Carolyn, do you have any final points before we sign off? Just to say thank you. Um, it was such a fantastic conversation. Really grateful to all of the panelists. As I told you earlier, I was uh, taking lots of notes. And um, Michael, you're always fantastic. And it was uh, it was just a really wonderful event. And many thanks to Michelle. Michelle, I'm working really closely with on the lab. She's the senior manager, and this wouldn't be happening without all of that she does. So really thank you. And to all, everyone who took the time to, um, to attend today's event, really grateful. And please join us on the 27th for upending the energy landscape, which will be same time. It'll be uh, from noon until one and um, it should promises to be a great conversation. <laughs>